I want to talk with you tonight, as Livia said, about friendship. You know, I meet with a lot of students, of course. That's one of the great joys of my job as I get to do pastoral care. And so I've met with many of you. And I know a lot of you are seeking, what are you to do with your lives? What does God want you to do? What is your vocation? And of course, those are important questions um, because you sense that you'll be spending a lot of your time doing work and you want that work to be meaningful. You want it to bring you happiness. But if you ask most people where their daily and weekly happiness comes from, they will tell you that it comes from their friendships. Or if you ask them where a lot of their pain comes from, it comes from loneliness or the lack of friendships. So there's probably few things in our lives that you and I are going to value above friendship. Uh, here's a picture of myself and four of my friends. Um, this is where we meet every Wednesday morning. I took this picture last week. I could have taken it this morning because we were there outside the Rooster Cafe this morning. By the way, if you don't know the Rooster Cafe in Costa Mesa, it's great. Sometimes I get this. That would be Portuguese scramble. Sometimes I get this. That would be huevos rancheros. And sometimes I get the early riser breakfast sandwich, which is the bacon, cheese, egg, and mayonnaise. And if you don't like mayonnaise, you haven't had an early morning breakfast sandwich. But these are my buddies. And we have been meeting together for um, 40 years, since high school. Every month, every week, um, when, we were, when we were all living in town, and we've lived in town for most of our lives, uh, for the last 10 years, we've been meeting weekly on Wednesday mornings at the Rooster Cafe. I'm pretty lucky. That's not common to have friends this long. Um, it all started back when we were in a youth group, Mariner's Church in Newport Beach. And we were in a Bible study there and a youth group trips. And even at the age of 16 or so, we started opening our lives to one another, talking about what 16-year-olds talk about. Um, Friendships, romances, ambitions for college, what is God's will for our lives, disappointments, failures, the meaning of success. And of course, we had a lot of fun. We have so many stories. We have the goods on each other. Um, but you know, our lives did go on in, in many different directions. There's two lawyers in this group. There's an ad executive, there's a pastor, and there's me, a college professor and dean. We all married women who are friendly, but they're not necessarily best friends. We've all lived at various other places in these last 40 years um, for periods of time. So you know what's really held us together over all these years is somehow we've always wanted to know what God was doing in each other's lives. Our friendships were rooted in our, each of our friendships with Jesus. And I don't think it would have survived in the way it has without that. Um, you now these days on Wednesday mornings we talk about a lot of things. We talk about sports and politics and family. We laugh a lot. Um, but you know at some point we make it our way around to how we're experiencing God, how we're enjoying him, and how he's leading our lives. And it's a conversation we've been having for 40 years. Um, so you know given our long friendship and given the topic of friendship I want to talk on tonight, I wanted to read this passage from John 15, which in some ways is startling. Jesus writes this. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. So if you didn't catch that, Jesus called us his friends. Um, that's pretty extraordinary for the God of the universe to say that he is our friend. Now, you have to remember the context here in which he's speaking to them. It's that upper room in Jerusalem. They finally come back to Jerusalem, and they know what that means. That means danger. There are people in Jerusalem who want to kill Jesus. And he himself has already been hinting in various ways that he may be leaving them, that his death may be imminent. 
He's already said someone's going to betray him. He's already washed their feet in this unusual ceremony which has created a new family among them. And you know, he said, I know that some of you are worried, but I am going away and it's going to be to your advantage. They're thinking, how could this possibly be to our advantage that you're going away? But he says, you know, up to now I've been able to love you just like this, person to person. But if I go away, I can send the Holy Spirit and I will actually be so much closer to you. I'll actually be able to be inside you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is reassuring them. Basically, he's saying, look, our friendship doesn't stop no matter what's going to happen this weekend. We will go on being friends, and in a way that is even beyond your imagination. Of course, the disciples really have no idea what he's talking about. Um, So yeah, to call them friends, well, that's surprising, because he is our Lord. He's our God. He was actually at the beginning of the world, existing pre-eternally, and he could have used any number of metaphors, right? Master, slave, king, subject, Um, but he chose friendship. He calls them friends. So I just wanted to explore this with you. What is it like to be friends with Jesus? What is it like not only to call him our Lord and our God, but our friend? And how could that possibly teach us what our friendships would be like within Jesus? So the first thing I want to say is that what Jesus does is he particularizes friendship. There's a particularization of friendship. And what he says in verse 16 here, he says, I didn't, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And that's unusual because rabbis at that time would be chosen by disciples. Disciples would choose which rabbi they wanted to learn under. But Jesus says, I chose you. And I don't know about you, but for me, it is so powerful to be chosen. I don't know if you could think back to a time when you have been chosen. Maybe you were chosen for some kind of team. Or maybe you were chosen for some kind of ministry. Um, you know, to be chosen is to be seen right? It's to be noticed. It's to be valued. Um, Jesus knew these disciples in particular. In fact, if you remember John, um, early on in John chapter 1, verse 46, Jesus, uh, Philip comes to Nathaniel, his friend, and says, hey, you got to come. I think we found the guy, the guy that Moses spoke of. I think we found him, the Messiah. And of course, Nathaniel, if you remember, goes, where's he from? And Philip goes, he's from Nazareth. And he's like, no good thing comes out of Nazareth. He goes, just come and see, just come and see, Philip says to Nathaniel. So he goes, and Jesus sees him, and he says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel says, how did you know me? And Nathaniel immediately follows Jesus. The desire to be seen, the desire to be noticed, the desire to be known. Jesus, see, he particularized uh, Nathanael. He saw him, he noticed him, and he knew him. And in the mystery of God's providence, somehow this is still the same, and I don't know how it works. I don't know how there can be billions of people on the planet, and God can actually particularize them. You know, I have a friend who, who who thinks, gosh, if God loves everyone, if God loves everyone, then how do I know he really knows me? But we're told that he does. Somehow in the amazing mystery of who God is, he can love the whole world, but also love people in particular. Right, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, for now we see only kind of dimly as in a mirror, but then we will see God face to face. And he's, of course, talking about when we will see Jesus finally. We will see him face to face, but then he says something very strange. He says, now I know only in part. I, I, I have a, a notion of who God is, and I, 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 I can't completely grasp who he is, but then, but then I will fully know, and he could stop there. Paul could have just stopped there and said, then I will fully know him. But then he says, even as I am fully known. Wow. Paul says, I am fully known by God and someday I will fully know him in return. So Jesus particularizes. He does love us all, but somehow he he knows our particular person. Psalm Psalm 139, he, he knows me when I rise up and when I lay down. And so we ask him to search us and know our hearts. I don't think there's anything we want more than to be known and loved by someone. I I used to put my kids to bed when they were younger. Uh, their names are Abby and Carly. And, uh, and you know, I would just say, I would pray for them, and I would just actually uh, say, you know, God loves your Carliness. Carly, your Carliness. 
See, not just what you do, not just what you achieve, although that's part of you, but he loves your carliness. I said, Abby, he loves your abbiness. There's something particularizing about the love of God that blows our minds, but it actually is the case according to scripture, and certainly was the case according to Jesus. Friendship with Jesus means that you are known, you are particularized, he knows you in particular. It's incredible. What's the second aspect of friendship with Jesus? Well, friendship is always a shared vision. Um, C.S. Lewis says, you know, lovers are kind of, uh, you know, we can kind of image them as people um, staring at each other face to face. But friends look out at a third thing together that they love. Friendship is a shared vision of a third thing. Again, getting back to my family, when, I, when we, we were newly married and we had our first child, we used to watch TV, but after that we just ate and put Carly in the swing and just pushed her and watched her. <laughs> we were two people, we were, were lovers, but we were also friends looking at a third thing we loved. So friendship is composed of two people having a shared vision of the good. And that's what Jesus says here, right? You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. See, he says, what what makes a servant a servant is he's not brought into the inner ring. He's not brought into the vision. He's not brought into the plans and the mysteries and the secrets of the family. But I've called you friends, he says. For everything I've heard from the Father, I have made known to you. In other words, friendship with Jesus means he's let us in on the secret on the meaning and purpose of life. The goodness that God wants to restore all things, what the Old Testament calls shalom, what the New Testament calls the kingdom of God, wants us to look at what could be in friendship with him. Jesus shares with his disciples the secret, the secret that everyone wants to know, what is this all about? And to gaze at that, and that is what forms friendship, to look out at his third thing. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 calls it all a mystery, but he says, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. These things have been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, I love that. Even the deep things of God the Spirit searches, and for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What Paul's saying is, wow, the deep things of God, because we have the Spirit of God, are known to us. We can see to some extent what God sees or imagines. We've seen... um, uh, throughout history, a lot of famous friendships, right? There's the, in the upper left, the Inklings, C.S. Lewis, Owen Barfield, J.R. Tolkien, um, and the last one is uh, Williams, Charles Williams. Uh, all believers, all doing, all doing their writings. Uh, Williams was a novelist. Tolkien, of course, you know. Lewis, you know, and Clive Owen, um, also a writer. They were looking out at a third thing, which is their love of literature, and their love of God. You have Martin Luther King and all those who walked with him and looking out at what could be justice and shalom and restoration, a shared vision that brought them together. And then even as we think recently of the death of Aretha Franklin and there you've got Stevie Wonder and and others, just the shared joy of music and what she stood for. Friendship is a shared vision that brings friends together. And finally, I want to say that, um, and I I didn't know the best word for this, but that friendship with Jesus is not only particularizing, and it's not only a shared vision, but it actually is a kind of divine mentoring. As friends with Jesus, we have a divine mentor. And probably the most difficult verse in this chapter is this one. You are my friends if you do what I command you. That's nothing we'd want to hear from a friend normally, right? (laughs) You're only my friend if you do what I command you. And then that's like, well, I don't, I don't know if I like that. But I want you to think of this in, in kind of a different way. And here's where I want to get back to Spielberg. So my daughter uh, goes to, um, uh, goes to uh, a film school at another university, which will name, remain unnamed. And, um, and, the, and the university had a whole class on Steven Spielberg. And, uh, and so um, it turns out that, they, uh, that Steven Spielberg was gonna come to class uh, on one of those nights. And so 
Uh, students can invite one friend, so my daughter invited me to come. And so uh, none of her other friends could come. So uh, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I think I was the first one she asked. And, uh, and so we both went, and it's a big auditorium there, and uh, you know, there's 300 students and guests, so it's very full. And you know, they're all waiting for Steven Spielberg to arrive. You know, he's kind of on his own time frame, so you know, we're, they're kind of, the professor's kind of you know, uh, warming up the crowd, so to speak, you know, waiting for Spielberg to come. And by the way, it's like, oh, when Steven Spielberg, okay, nobody, nobody touch him, nobody ask any questions, just let him come up. You know, it's, it's all very kind of arranged. And, uh, and so suddenly, 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 like an epiphany, he just comes in and the place just stands on its feet and just, I mean, he hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> I mean, I want that. I want to get, walk in and get a standing ovation and thank you, goodbye. Um, and then here it is. It's just 90 minutes of Q&A with Steven Spielberg. He didn't even do a talk. He just says, fire away. Ask anything you want. And these are students who have studied him the whole semester. So they got a lot of great questions. They know his works. And they, nearly every question, you know, the student would stand up and go, hello, Mr. Spielberg, um, I'm in film school because of you. Um, you are the, <laughs> and they would actually use the word the master. You are the master, and they'd bow like that a little bit. <laughs> you are the master. <laughs> and if you saw that short clip, he is the master. Oh my gosh, I mean, that clip goes on for three or four more minutes about all the Spielberg films. So I want you to have that context. Jesus has been with these disciples for three years. They know he's the master. Now can you imagine one day if you're a film student at Biola University and you get a message from someone that says, hey, Steven Spielberg called and you know, he, um, he has an interest in you and he'd like to become your friend. See, that, that's, that would be mind-blowing, that the master wants to become my friend. And here's what he says, though. He says, hey, you know, we, let's be friends, but would you please do what I ask you to do? Because I want you to work on a film with me. I want us to, to, as friends, work on this film. Would you let me teach you? Would, you? would you do what I ask you to do? Would you let me mentor you? Because if, if we do that, then our friendship could deepen because it's around this third thing. And I can mentor you in this third thing that we love. What would you say? You say I'd absolutely do what you want to do, Mr. Spielberg, the master. Um, so we need to hear that you are my friends if you do what I command you in that context. You know, as Tim Mulehoff in the communication department will say, when we're communicating with another person, there's two things going on. One is our actual content, what we're saying. One kind of communication is the words I'm speaking to you right now. Sentences that have meanings that you're understanding. But the other thing that different kind of communication is, is called, um, what is he called? He calls relational content. There's conceptual content, there's what my words mean, but then there's relational content being passed back and forth, which is how you feel I'm treating you, or how you feel I'm receiving you, or whether I'm hostile, or whether I'm loving, or whether I'm cold, or whether I'm warm. There's this relational content that is an act of communication. And I want you to think of this night in the upper room where Jesus is not only telling them things, not only commanding them things, but the relational content is one of great love and intimacy and reassurance, inviting them to obey him so they can deepen their friendship in this shared vision of what life could look like. And Jesus says, will you do this with me? Do you wanna be friends? Will you do what I command you? And you are like, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. And so now notice this is said to a group of people. So now it's not just a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. It's this whole group of disciples that, yeah, let's become friends with each other and do this together. Let's know each other. Let's particularize one another. Let's have a shared vision with Jesus and let's follow the master in this divine mentoring or friendship. That would be an amazing thing not just with Steven Spielberg, but with Jesus. You know, I have no chance of being friends with Steven Spielberg, none. I am a friend of Jesus, though. Amazing, amazing. 
So what can we learn about this friendship with Jesus with regard to the friendships among ourselves? And in particular, what it means to have and be a spiritual friend. Well, let's just walk back through. We want our friendships to be ones where we can particularize one another. Where people can feel known and love. And you know, to do that, you have to create an environment of love and safety because all of us are really scared. We're really scared of rejection. I don't know if you've ever like, looked over a body of water like a bay or a pond and occasionally you see the flash of a fish with the sunlight glancing off the fish and then down it goes. People are a little bit like that. If they don't sense an environment of love and safety, just down they go. Down they hide. And all their particularity, all their secrets, all the ways that can, they can be known, they kind of just go below the surface. So the first thing we need to do with one another is provide an atmosphere of love and safety. And in that, we, then we just want to start peeling back their hearts, asking them questions, how things are going, how's the semester been, what has been a great joy to you, what has been a struggle, but always in this atmosphere of love and safety and just peeling the onion. And of course, this will differ based on the depth of your relationship with someone, but there should be someone who peels the onion for you and for whom you peel the onion through your compassionate listening. You know, listening, wow, that is kind of a lost art. Do you know there's an organization out there called Seven Cups of Tea? And it's an organization that universities can contract with that are basically have hundreds of therapists online, or actually on the phone, and they're just paid to listen to people. So you can dial up Seven Cups of Tea, they'll uh, connect you with someone, and you can just talk. It's not even therapy, you can just talk and listen. There's a dearth of listeners in our world. But the particularization of others, getting to know them, requires this ability to listen, to articulate their hearts, to open them up for them. And to be the kind of friend who's safe, I'll tell you what kills it, is gossip. It just kills it. Even if someone hears you gossiping about someone else, they will register in their mind, this person may then next gossip about me. That will kill it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Consider the secrets of one another, the sacred trust. Create this environment of love and safety. And you know what they'll do? They'll just open up to you. They'll just open up to you. Particularize them. Next, evoke a shared vision with one another. And of course here, this is particularly relevant to your relationships with other believers. I hope, of course, an atmosphere like this, you do, but I hope you'll continue to find those people in your life that don't just have a shared vision of your hobbies, and that's great, but sometimes it only lasts for a while. If you've ever been on a team with someone, when the team's over, usually the relationships drift. What is the one shared vision that can last a whole life? Well, it's the meaning of life. When Jesus says to Martha about Mary in that one episode, you know, Mary's doing the one thing that can't be taken away from her. And Jesus doesn't tell, that, tell us what it is. What's the one thing that can't be taken away from Mary? Her relationship with God. All other things are gonna fall away. But that's the one thing that can't be taken. So friendships that are based in a relationship with God is the one thing that will survive over time. And so in our friendships, we need to be encouraging the shared vision, especially in times of failure and disappointment. When people will tend to think they failed God, or maybe God's failed them. We want to restore to them the shared vision, the secret that God wants to redeem all things. He wants to restore all things. This is a long-term project we get to be a part of. And so we want to return one another to the love and acceptance of God in their failures. When they begin to think redemption's not possible, or family situations can't be redeemed, or relationships can't be healed, or they can't be healed, or they can't be forgiven, we need to return them to the big picture of redemption. It will happen. Healing will occur. And we wanna restore one another. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 says, we urge you brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid. Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. 
restore them to the vision of redemption that will last their whole lives. And finally, divine men mentoring. We need to help each other identifying what God is doing and cooperate with that. And you know, my, my guys, Jay, Bob, Mark, Scott, and myself on Wednesday mornings, I, we talk about a lot of different stuff. But at some point, it will always come down to this. Yeah, what is God doing in your life, and how can you, can you cooperate with it? See, we can't change ourselves, right? But we can help each other listen to God and assist each other in how to respond to him in our lives. To assist each other in searching our hearts, in gaining understanding, in enjoying God, in, in creating habits and disciplines, in pursuing our own healing, in loving our families, in supporting our churches, um, and to listen to God, to the divine mentoring a kind of group mentoring before God. Friendship is one of the great gifts in this life. And I encourage you to seek out people whom you can particularize and be particularized by and known. People um, who you can engage in divine mentoring with and people with whom you can have a shared vision. And I know it doesn't happen easily our Bible study in high school started out with 30 people. And it's not that the rest of them aren't following God, they're just in different places, but God has gifted me with five that are still together in this place. I consider it a gift. I couldn't have engineered it. But you know what? I opened to it, and I was faithful to it. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.